Let us pray. God, open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts to receive your word. Open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world around us. And open our lives to the infinite possibilities born of your love. Amen. It all happened in a matter of moments. It was a Friday evening that seemed like every other Friday evening in Paris. People were off to do the things that we do on a Friday evening. Go catch a soccer game, go out to dinner, go hear a concert, just go out and have some fun. But this Friday evening would be unlike any other Friday evening. A series of coordinated attacks throughout the 10th arrondissement in Paris left over 100 people dead and many others injured critically. Whatever we thought we understood about a sense of safety and a sense of peace was all gone. And we were reminded just how quickly the world could turn and things could become something that we did not understand. What almost went under the radar in the midst of all of that was that just the day before, in a residential area of Beirut, nearly 40 innocent civilians had also been killed and many others, scores others, left wounded. And so, for us in the world, there were a couple of days that didn't seem to make an enormous amount of sense and left us all grieving and mourning and wondering what to make of the things that had just happened. And then today, we meet up with this incredible lesson from Mark's Gospel. Now, folks who would say that these must indeed be the ends of times, they would look at events like the events that have just taken place and say, Yes, indeed, these are the ends of times. Isn't this what, isn't this exactly, isn't it exactly what Jesus said? So we pull apart this lesson from Mark this morning as we're all still reeling from what's happened in these last few days to try to see what this lesson has to tell us. When we find Jesus and the disciples in this lesson, they're coming out of the temple. This would be the rebuilt temple because we know from our biblical history that the first temple was destroyed when the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem, what, probably about some 550, 600 years before this. So this is the rebuilt temple in all of its grandeur, huge stones, this is a formidable, impenetrable structure. Nothing can happen to this temple. And the disciples come out, and they're immediately noting this for Jesus. Look at this building. Look at these stones. Isn't this grand? Isn't this wonderful, Jesus? 
and how shocked and frightened they must be when Jesus says to them, all these stones are going to come down. This is not permanent. Jesus and the disciples are living in a period that we now refer to as Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Whatever poverty, whatever persecution, whatever things had been going on in the lives of these people, what they had peace from during this time of Pax Romana was invasion from everyone else. And we know that those children called Israel, well, they had been invaded by pretty much everybody. And they had been taken over by pretty much everybody in the course of their history. So life may not have been great for them under the rule of the Roman Empire, but one thing was certain, other people were coming in and constantly invading them and taking them over. There had been some sense of peace. As Jesus begins to come forward with this incredible story about all these things that are going to happen, the disciples have got to be thinking, aren't we past this? Haven't we gotten to a point where we're not worried about nations rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom and wars being raged everywhere? Haven't we gotten past that, Jesus? We thought we were done with that now. This may not be a great life, but it's not that life. We all thought we were past that. And they're trying to figure out, when is all this going to happen? What are these signs? Jesus, this doesn't make any sense. Because life is hard enough as it is, and the notion that it's going to get worse That's not good news. Where's the good news in that? Where's the good news in that? You've come to help us. Where's the good news? And it's going to get worse. And Jesus goes on to tell them, only God knows. Only God knows when the reign of God will come to pass. Many will try to lead you astray. Many will try to use Jesus' name and try to lead you astray. But it's only God who's got the answer to that question about when the reign of God actually will come to pass. And Jesus doesn't describe this as the end of times. Notice how Jesus describes it. It's not the end of times. It's the beginning of the birth pangs. The beginning of the birth pangs, not the end of times. The beginning of the birth pangs suggests something entirely different because that suggests life and hope. That doesn't suggest an end. Life and hope. This lesson is paired rather magnificently today with our Old Testament lesson from the first book of Samuel. And I want to spend a little time talking about Hannah today because here is somebody who's desperate for birth pangs, isn't she? She is so desperate for birth pangs. Her husband has two wives. Peninnah The other wife, she's got lots of children. But Hannah, we're told in this particular text that God has closed her womb. And in her culture, the shame that a woman knows for not being able to give her husband offspring is tremendous. And so here is Hannah grieving and mourning that she is unable to give her husband that which would truly make her be a woman of her culture. 
she can't have a child. And the other wife, well, she's just seized upon this opportunity to taunt her and deride her and belittle her and tell her just how worthless she is. And Hannah cries, and she prays, and none of the words of reassurance that her husband can give her, that double portion of food that he gives her, you have to wonder about that double portion of food, nothing that Elkanah can do makes this any better for Hannah. She just wants a child so desperately. And when she goes to pray, and Eli is sitting there at this temple door watching her, and she's praying, her lips are moving, and she's nothing, he can't hear her saying anything, she, her, it's just her lips moving. And she has yet one more moment of shame because now she's got the priest thinking that she's actually come there drunk. And all she wants to do is pray. She prays, and she makes a promise to give God back the very thing that she's asking for. You give me a son, and you know what? I'm going to give that son right back to you. He will be yours. He will be dedicated and consecrated to you. He's yours. Just give me that child. How desperate Hannah is for birth pangs. How desperate she is for new life. And the new life which ultimately comes from her, Samuel, not only becomes a great judge of his people called Israel, but he becomes a great prophet for them as well new life, hope that have come from those birth pangs. It's more than fascinating that Jesus uses this metaphor, the beginning of birth pangs, to describe the coming of the kingdom of God. These are not end times, these are the beginnings. This is the time of new life, this is the time of grace. And a time for God's people to remain faithful, to not be led astray by those who would call God's name, but not understand. And it puts us in the same place as the disciples, doesn't it? Because we live in our own kind of Pax Romana. We do. We live in our own sense of Pax Romana, that there's a relative sense of peace, at least around us. Around us, there's a relative sense of peace and calm. And the notion that things are going to get worse, that there are going to be earthquakes and famines, and war and nations raising up against other nations? Well, that doesn't sound very good to us because that sounds like a disruption of the peace that we think we know. And yet, it is through that pain that Jesus tells us that the kingdom of God will be ushered in. Not through our comfort, but instead through our discomfort. That's hard to hear. That's hard to want to accept. So what do we do now? What do we do? What do we tangibly go out and do? I'm sure that some of you have seen the video message from our new presiding bishop. Michael Curry has suggested that we come to a time of prayer. 
now, I know there are people who say prayer just doesn't seem like enough. There seems like